Welcome to Getting Better with Dr. Adam. Dr. Adam Silberstein is a clinical psychologist who has been working in the field since 1993. With a broad range of clinical experience, including state psychiatric hospitals, adolescent residential treatment with a trauma focus, the Department of Corrections, and in the addiction treatment arena. He is currently in private practice and is the clinical director and co-founder of Westside Treatment, a young adult dual diagnosis treatment facility in West LA. This podcast is for general information and entertainment purposes only. This should not be considered treatment advice, nor is it a substitute for an individual treatment plan. If you have questions or concerns about your individual situation, it is strongly recommended you consult a licensed professional to talk about things that are specific to you. If there's an emergency, it is strongly recommended you seek treatment at your nearest emergency room. I just met with Dr. Christina Scardo. Um, had a very, very interesting conversation about how humans aren't so nice to themselves and could be very self-critical. She referred to this inner critic that takes painful situations and finds reasons to pummel the individual. You know, it's an internal mechanism. I find a reason to pummel myself and how that serves this adaptive function of how to navigate pain and make sense of it. And when it's overdone, it could actually be very painful and hurt too much. And what she taught us was how to access and cultivate self-compassion make peace by facing your pain and learning how to see it for what it is and how to speak to it and relate to it in a way that's actually healing. Welcome to Getting Better with Dr. Adam. I have the privilege of meeting with Dr. Christina Scardo. She is the co-founder of Straight Up Treatment and very interested in the subject of self-compassion and I just thought, wow, I'd really like to meet somebody who wants to focus on being nice to themselves and helping other people be nice to themselves. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And I just, in having you here, I'm thinking, how does somebody get interested? You know, there's so many interest areas of psychology. There's anxiety disorders, There's which I know you have a specialty in. There's family work. There's actually help in business. I know you, you know, in organizations there's trauma work, you know, there's all sorts of things we can get interested in. And one of your interest areas is self-compassion. It got my attention because, you know, when I work with people, I notice, man, you're being so mean to yourself. Look at the way you speak to yourself. And um, I just wanted to hear from you. How did you become interested in self-compassion? Oh, well, like most things, I think as therapists and psychologists, there tends to be this path of self-discovery. And, you know, this just deeper knowing that things weren't ever good enough for me or I was never good enough, you know. And so as I ventured into committing to learning more about psychology and majoring in psychology, I discovered things like mindfulness and meditation and, you know, some of these really great practices that help you build this inner awareness and just knowing of that inner critic and that voice. Um, And I guess for myself, I never really um, was able to separate the two, that voice that was just constantly beating me up or, you know, telling me I wasn't good enough or things weren't going to work out or, you know, when I fail that I'm the only one that's failing, right, Mm -hmm. or uh, falling short or messing up. I never really acknowledge like, hey, that is a voice in my head, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that it's fact or that it's truth. And I think through my own practice and my own self-discovery, I became really passionate about this idea of self-compassion, of learning how to be nice and kind, especially in moments of pain um, and suffering. That's when we need it the most. So did you sort of, was there a time that you remember where you almost couldn't discern the what you called the inner critic or mm-hmm. the harsh voice mm-hmm. and, you know, some sort of different reality than that's, I, I hear you saying that's just a voice, but there's more than that. That, that is not the only part of me. It is a part of me. There's a voice going on. Right. But do you remember a time, cause I certainly do where I couldn't discern much of anything. So it was just sort of, you know, my thoughts were just, you know, absor- you know, I was, I was Consum- absorbed in them and consumed. I couldn't really discern what's what. So everything felt real. So was that your experience too? Yeah, I actually have a a very recent example. I was in um, 
a car accident over the weekend. Oi. And it was my fault. It was a minor accident. So no one got hurt, fortunately, right? We were all okay. It was kind of a fender bender sort of a thing. Um, but, you know, in doing all this self-compassion work and trying to discern these voices and all these things that we're talking about is interesting. I got really hooked on this idea of, you know, it was my fault and just how much of a bad driver I am and how terrible I am and how I ruin these people's evenings, right? And so even myself, I was getting really hooked in these thoughts and my husband was like, it's an accident, you know, like that's why it's called an accident because people mess up and make mistakes. And even with that, even having some of this objective, you know, perspective being thrown at me, that voice was just like, no, you know, like you should feel bad. You should feel guilty. All this you should shame. call it on an on purpose. Yeah, instead exactly. of an accident. Right, right. right. I you should an, have known better. I was in an on purpose. Uh-huh. Right? Uh-huh. Exactly. Right. So so when someone introduces the other perspective, the job of the critic is to challenge that and say, no, 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 that can't be true. Totally. Right. Yeah. And to really dismiss, you know, hey, it's not an accident, it's an on purpose. And I just ruined, and I should know better. And so there's a, a should factor and it invites, it invites bad feelings. Definitely. So this is something that, that became interesting to you as, as I'm, as I'm speaking, I'm thinking of like groups I do, and I'm thinking of the reaction of, I work a lot in the addiction community. And, you know, if we talk about being absorbed in thought life, there's a reason why mental health professionals are working with people with addiction, even though they're using drugs, their, their thought life are, you know, it's so, it's so painful to watch the, um, triggers of thought mm -hmm. and, um, what they often say to me is, I don't want to hear about observing my thoughts. It's too hard. Yeah. I can't. This is too hard to take a step back and have an observing stance and so forth. So in terms of, of you know, either, either your own experience or your own work with, 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 with your clients, do you find that, that is a, it's very hard to get out of the loop? Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely very tough to notice uh, I'm having thoughts, but they don't define who I am, that there's something bigger, you know, that there, a, there's a bigger part of me that can actually have thoughts, you know, there's this deeper part. And so I think it's tough when we're in moments of pain, uh, you know, part of how we're wired is we want to feel congruent internally. And so sometimes hearing alternative perspectives, even if they feel better or sound better, our mind will reject that, you know? And so I really felt that in this accident situation, there was kind of this like simultaneous awareness of like, you're beating yourself up. Mm -hmm. You're being really unkind. You're being kind of irrational, right? Um, but because I was still afraid and I still had these feelings lingering, you know, from having, you know, just having this accident, I think it was really tough for me to be able to take in any other perspective, even my own. So this is get, getting me sort of thinking about this. I'm in such pain. Let's say I'm worrying or let's say, you know, I'm thinking about the future or I'm, I'm, I'm upset about something that recently happened, a relationship issue or whatever mm -hmm. I bring. Mm -hmm. When I'm in the disturbed state, right, when I'm in distress, you know, what I'm hearing is it's very hard to access it, this reasonable perspective of, hey, you know, there's another way to look at it. You didn't do it on purpose or yeah. things usually work out. And all that evidence is is easily rejected by the critic. Let's call it the critic, mm -hmm. right? Or let's call it whatever, whatever it is. The critic's relationship with painful situations is I'm going to reject the information that I, I'm, I'm actually not going to allow you to be so nice to yourself. You right. can try, but I'm not going to allow you to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you need to feel the pain is what it says, right? That you messed up or this was hard. And so I think feeling that pain, there's some validation in that. So sometimes what you're saying, reasonable thought, right? Or offering different perspectives. There's a bit of an invalidation. At least that's how I felt in this experience, right? That they're um, with this accident situation. Um, that there's an invalidation in what way? That I did something wrong, that it was not okay. You know, whatever that pain is. Oh. I messed up. I made a mistake, you know, that we need like time to kind of be with that. But the way that our minds work, this critic, it really um, tries to kick you when you're down to make sure you're, you're feeling the con congruency of that pain. You so know? I'm in pain. What you're saying is I'm supposed to be in pain. Yep. I'm supposed to be in pain. And maybe the adaptive job on some level mm -hmm. of the critic is you need to be with your pain. Right. 
You fucked up. Exactly. You fucked up and you should feel the gravity of that experience. Mm -hmm. Almost as, let's even lose the word critic. Maybe there, are you saying that there's some, some benefit to the experience of being in the critic space or the judgment of, hey, you fucked up. Totally. And I think, you know, this is also dependent on culture and there's some societal norms here too. I think that when you mess up, right, that you should uh, take ownership for that and you should learn from that. And I think these are kind of core values that we share, right, as a society. Um, And so the critic can kind of take that and really try to give you some tough love, you know? And I think sometimes that voice, it's a little different for everyone. But if we really think back to like, who does this voice remind me of? You know, is this a parent? Is this a teacher? Is this who who is helping me through difficult times and, and earlier places in my life? And oftentimes we'll see that that critic does mimic some other figures in our lives, some other experiences that we had um, of helping us learn and get through difficult experiences. And as, you know, we get older, that voice, um, it really tries to offer some tough love, so to speak. So... It, it, is, it is the voice of how I learned early on, perhaps, right, that some sort of authority figure was, was teaching me lessons. Yep. And when I make a mistake or I'm in distress and I'm disappointed in myself and I'm being hard on myself, I'm reengaging that voice or my interpretation of that voice and I'm having an experience of tough love mm-hmm. uh, towards myself. Yeah. And, and I keep coming back to this and on some level, right, that's okay. Meaning I, I, there's something that, that needs to be learned mm-hmm. in this experience is what you're saying. It may not need hours and hours <laughs> and days and days, but the first order of business is the, the, the construction of this is, is based on learning. Right, right. And learning how to, sit, how to deal and cope and problem solve painful situations. Totally. And to be able to recognize like, ouch, this hurts. Mm-hmm. Right. That this needs attention. This is painful. This is hard, whatever it is. So there's almost. And maybe maybe you you agree with this. I, I read this book on spiritual bypassing, mm-hmm. this idea that I, I run quickly to solution and I don't want to experience the anger or the fear. And there's something to be said about owning, oh, I'm hurting. I feel bad. I got in an accident. Yeah. Right. It doesn't sit well with me. Definitely. Right. And I have to I have to be be in that space a little bit. Yeah. I think a big one too is shame. So when we mess up um, or we fuck up, right? there's a ton of shame that comes up with that, shame and guilt. So I think even beneath fear and anger, shame and guilt is really where the inner critic is going to swoop in um, and try to, quote unquote, help you through it by giving you some tough love, right, To, to motivate you to change, to problem solve. But I think it's the process and the way we go about that listening to the inner critic, feeding into the inner critic, that actually causes us suffering, Mm -hmm. you know, and there's this, this kind of discussion of pain versus suffering and what the difference is, you know, pain is, are those initial, um, difficulties, challenges, things that don't feel good. These experiences we have in life, the moment of the accident, the moment of the accident, that's pain, right? And the aftermath of exchanging licenses, it happened. Yeah. It's not, you would be weird probably, um, if you said, oh, I'm so happy. Totally. That I had this experience. I'm yeah. so grateful for the opportunity to hit you and slow down your evening and have you called. You know what? You really, I think it'll be helpful to all of us to have a mindful experience around right. an accident. Yeah. You're not going to, that's not going to be the story of an accident. It's going to be, damn it. Yeah. Right. I, I can't believe this happened. This sucks. And it's so funny as you're saying that my inner critic is going, yeah, that is how you should be, right? That is how you should react, right? That's a more positive way to react to that. Uh, yeah. So, right there. It's right here talking to me. So we talk a lot in our treatment team meetings about um, shame and guilt. And what's your under, you know, okay, I feel I it, when I was a kid, um, and I made mistakes, you know, I was taught lessons. Sometimes the lessons were, were, you know, it could have been, you know, in a social context with other kids, mm-hmm. you know, being embarrassed that, that I made a mistake and, or that I, I, I remember vividly an experience in, in third grade where a girl was in the middle of prayer and was told to be, to be quiet. And she, 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 she had an accident. Mm. And you see a whole puddle beneath her and she ran out of the room. And I always wondered, you know, what it would be like for her, that moment of everybody noticing 
and how embarrassed she was and 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 how that travels with her, that shame mm -hmm. from that experience. How do you understand and do you look at shame as something like we just got to get rid of it and it's just it has no place and shame and guilt and how do you differentiate? And this is just a lot of discussion we have. So what's your take on it? Yeah, so I think shame, it serves a function. We're, you know, all of our human experiences serve some sort of evolutionary adaptive purpose, right? And so I think for me, shame, um, it actually helps me stay connected to others in an odd sort of way, right? Because I think shame by definition means that we're feeling non-accepted from the group or there's some threat to being accepted to the group. And so if we don't have shame, if the goal is to get rid of shame, there's other consequences I think we can have. I'm sure we know or have seen people that maybe lack some shame in their behaviors or their choices or the way they treat others or themselves, right? And so I think there is there is some value to shame, to having the experience of shame of recognizing um, that is separating me perhaps from others. And I actually care about wanting to be accepted. So it keeps me in line socially. It can. Right? As part it of can. a community. It keeps me, it, it could keep me on the straight and narrow in terms of my own values and what's, what I see as, right. as reasonable, you know, re a reasonable way of being in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I think we need to know that though, in order to have perspective, because it can very easily and quickly turn into the, I am bad, you know, the I statement, or there's something wrong with me. I am flawed and it can become a part of our identity. Right. So you're saying, and I, I like the way you're going because what I hear often from other, like is it lets you eradicate shame. Right. And there is some value. It just, it just like anything else, if it gets overdone and it goes the wrong direction, mm -hmm. it can turn into a clobbering of myself right, right. and, an, and a, a messaging that I am the problem. Right. And I think any eyes are dangerous, not just shame. I am this, I, you know, I even I am great. I am wonderful. If we hold on to any eyes too rigidly and without some perspective of being able to see all parts of ourselves, right, and the deeper parts that are none of those things mm -hmm. um, in a more spiritual way, right, this kind of deeper knowing of the eye, uh, we can get fixed and blindsided uh, in, in different ways. You know, if we're overly confident, I think there's a big fear of that, right, of being overly confident, um, we can uh, negate or, you know, miss um, – you know, other limitations that we have or maybe the way we're impacting other people in a negative way because we're focused overly on the positive parts of ourselves. You know, so I think any I, whether it's shame or so I'm wonderful. I'm hearing a, a, a clinician who's into balance. Yeah. I hear in the, I'm, I'm making, this is what I'm telling myself in the context of the car accident, shame and guilt comes up, mm -hmm. right? I got to acknowledge it. There's a lesson to be learned. I want to I want some guidance on how to comport myself. I don't, and at a certain point, I have to be, I have to own it. I have to not run from it, but I also don't want to over-identify with it because in the over-identification of the I, I become the feelings, right? Right. I become the feelings. I take on, I am shame. I am guilt. You're terrible, terrible fuck up, right? And I don't, and that I, if it, if it, if it isn't, active in self-care or self-compassion will really, really tailspin into a story of pain. Very much so. Okay. Yeah. And that's when we start to move into reactivity and self-destructive behaviors, right? Whatever our habits are to not feel pain, to get rid of pain because it's not okay to be bad or it's not okay to have messed up. That's when we really start to see addiction, avoidance, slashing out, you know, um, all the different ways that we try to cope and not feel some of this stuff. So I want congruency, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. I want to have some sort of baseline of, I don't want to be in the pain. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to learn my lesson, beat myself up the right amount, yep. so to speak. My, 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 my way of being is, is I want to quickly do the necessary steps to get out of the pain. Right. Because I don't want to really feel the pain. I write. So and if I don't have the um, healthy way of addressing these, the, the pain, mm -hmm. right, I'm going to end up pursuing other things. Right. Be it addiction, be it avoidance, be it spinning out in a story. Mm -hmm. Right. Just spinning out of my head, whatever it is. And, and this is a in this discussion, it doesn't seem like we're targeting, you know, in the discussion of getting better. It's kind of like. Anybody can come in with it. I mean, this is not 
that's unique to one population. No, it's the human experience. This is very you know, much so. I, I, I don't it, the human experience, but I know people who don't roll this way. <laughs> that right? don't who don't beat themselves up too hard. Mm, and mm-hmm. I, I I've met people who are kind of nice to themselves, mm-hmm. right? They exist. It's I, it's part of a human experience to with with different degrees, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So there are some people who can p- relatively uh, quickly bounce back, right? Yeah. And and have um, less per- suffering. Less going suffering. back to the pain and the suffering, right? Part, right? And, and again, discerning the difference mm-hmm. you were saying between pain, the the actual interpretation of the event versus suffering. Mm-hmm. Right, the continued investment in the emotional experience. Yeah, all the stuff our mind adds to the hard thing that happened to us, essentially. Yes, yes. So, take me through who, like, uh, who comes to you to talk about how does this even come up in terms of you know people who come to you to get better? Mm-hmm. How does this? What's a scenario where um, you know the type of person? And again, we're saying it's a human condition on many levels the sufferer, how do you see it in practice? Yeah, so we work, we specialize in anxiety um, based, you know, mostly though with anxiety comes things like addiction and depression and um, all the ways that we can cope with anxiety, trying to feel better, trying to get control. Um, We all have anxiety, right? We need it to survive. It helps us scan for threats and make sure we react accordingly to promote our survival. Um, But these days we're not really fighting off tigers and hunting for food. And, you know, the, the, the modern world is very different in terms of what is threatening. Yes, threats exist, of course, right? I'm um, going back to the car accident. That could be threatening. That's why there's fear. That's why all these feelings are coming up for sure. Um, but really, most of our fears and anxiety, I think, are harnessed, at least in the people we see, um, are really kind of centered in the social anxiety realm of not being good enough not being worthy of love, not being deserving. Um, and I think in, in today's culture, especially with social media and, you know, this, this society of needing to one up, you know, needing to be special, needing to be unique, needing to be different, um, that a lot of the people we see really struggle with this idea of just feeling good enough feeling like it's going to work out for them, feeling like they can handle the curveballs that life throws, you know, the failures, the misfortunes, things not working out, relationships failing, jobs failing, you know. So we really work with a lot of individuals, um, you know, in the adult context that are kind of coming in with those. So let's take an example of, I mean, that could, there's, that's, a, that's a broad, broad category of, of I want to have the right relationship. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I so I'm looking at all I'm I'm looking at all my friends. They're they're all partnering, right? And I have a definite idea of what quote unquote the right person is supposed to look like. It's mm-hmm. not happening for me. So I can't, you know, I'm struggling yeah. in the dating world. Um so anxiety kicks in, right? Which yeah. is, I don't know if this is going to work out for me. Anxiety lives in the future. Exactly. The threat is there like you're talking about. I'm not going to be okay. Right. Danger, right. danger, danger. Yeah. Not going to be loved. I'm not going to be loved and that will, I, I, I'm not going to be okay because I won't be loved. Yep. Right. And the, and I start, I start swimming in my mind in the threat. It starts to get a lot of play. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And then, and you're right. You know, so many people Especially, you know, I, especially in perhaps in a pl- place like, you know, West Los Angeles, where I work and you work, right, where there's so much um, emphasis, right? There's so much of an emphasis on how it looks and, and, you know, popular culture. This is Hollywood. We collect, we collect the special people. Right, exactly. <laughs> we collect yeah. handsome, special, attractive And the standard people. and what it's supposed to look like and what it's supposed to be. Right. So, so in walks somebody into your office, right? So... How do you instruct or how do you help and facilitate um, self-compassion? Yeah, I think a, a big first step is the awareness piece of building that that ability to pay attention to what's happening in the moment, you know. So mindfulness is a big component of that. I mentioned that earlier that just through my own journey and path, I, I really discovered mindfulness and meditation to be extremely valuable. And I think... Um, you know, looking back on why I was so drawn to that is because there was a centeredness to being, you know, being able to control and to know like I'm having a thought or I'm having a feeling and being able to be with that Mm -hmm. and not necessarily need to do anything about it. And I think there's a lot of power in that, just building the awareness piece and being able to sit 
with some of these experiences in a somewhat detached but engaged way. You know, there's kind of a paradox in that. I'm not being consumed by it, like you were saying. I'm noticing, I'm having fears, right, that things aren't going to work out for me, that I'm not going to be okay. And being able to take that perspective of I'm having the thought. So stage one awareness. Let's yeah. Give me an example of the type of scenario that you may encounter where, um, in practice based on what you're talking about with anxiety. Uh huh. Well, actually, relationships, since we're on that topic, I think is a big one is this idea that it's, you know, it's not going to work out for me. I'm not going to find love. I'm not special enough. I'm not worthy enough. I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. So session one, I come in, I'm like, doc, right? I'm so old right? I'm so old. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm becoming a dinosaur here. I'm not going to get in. I'm, uh, it's never going to happen for me. Mm-hmm. I'm just damaged goods, right? So your first order of business is, wow, let's let's not judge. Let's just notice. Yeah. Well, I would I would say, wow, that's pretty harsh, you know, and it sounds like there's a period at the end of that, right? That it's it's over and done for you. And really just kind of bringing some of that awareness to the table of noticing, huh, our thoughts really um, try to pull us into believing that whatever it's feeding us is fact, right? Our mind, whatever our mind is feeding us is fact. It's not going to work out for me. I'm old, you know? So you're you're helping with the awareness of, you know, it seems like you, this is the, the end of the narrative is I'm screwed. Right. Right. I'm never I'm not going to be OK. Mm-hmm. You don't go anywhere else with it. Mm-hmm. I want you to just notice that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So this awareness phase of your treatment is just noticing. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And. And learning how to sit with noticing. Right. Right. And more, I think, active exercises. You know, we're definitely a skills focused practice in that we really try to teach um, and rehearse tools to build things like awareness. So, you know, I actually have. Um, people track and monitor their thoughts and really jot them down. You know, I have them do exercises to diffuse from their thoughts and their experiences. Like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, acceptance and commitment sure. therapy. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big acceptance and commitment therapy person too. And this idea of diffusion, of just n- getting unstuck from your thoughts and being able to look at your thoughts. So let's let's um, uh, sit with that Um my producer here just shared about, you know, people we work with who, when you say something like, I want you to sit with it, they say, I can't, I can't sit with it. Mm-hmm. I can't sit with it. So what would be a sit with it exercise? Yeah. Well, notice that your mind is telling you, you can't sit with it. Right. Even that noticing that that is a thought. And that, I think that there, that small space of awareness allows us to have power to make a choice. You can choose to not sit with it, right? And or we can work towards sitting with it. So making different choices. But I get so frustrated, right? Mm-hmm. Again, you would say, oh, that's a thought too. Yeah. So you're recording the exercise of recording the thought mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. sharing the thought, right? Is actually a diffusion. Totally. I can't sit with it. I can't. Right. And noticing that that's a thought. I get really frustrated, right? What does frustration actually feel like? Can you describe that to me, right? Where it notice frustration now, how it manifests, and really having people come back to their experience and and recording it as it is in the moment, as opposed to what our mind is saying it is and what it's going to mean. For so, our future. if somebody said to you, "This makes me want to crawl out of my skin. I want to run out of here," mm-hmm. right? It's and you'd say, "Yeah, it's hard, right? It's, that's a very difficult experience, and you're having it, right?" Right. So I'm going to throw, I'm going to be a little difficult. Yeah. All of you touchy feely people, right. Talk. So, you know, you talk so academically about this experience. I'm in agony. I'm in agony. Right. And I, I, I I can't close my eyes. I'm getting flooded with, with, with just discomfort. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. You are expecting me to sit through it. Mm -hmm. So, and you're just telling me just notice it. Mm Mm-hmm. So, as the first step, not as the end game, you know, the mind wants the end game, right? How are you going to get rid of this eventually, right? Sitting with it is the opposite of getting rid of it. It's actually so we allowing go, yourself to have it. So we go back to the car accident experience mm-hmm. and this congruence that I want, 
is is could sidestep a certain important experience, which mm-hmm. is be in the pain. Right. Right. Be in and and sit with it. Right. And notice it. Yeah. Because you can't not do that and expect to have relief. Right. Or the right type of relief. Exactly. The long term relief that we're looking for. You know, long term relief is being able to bounce back. As you noted earlier, right, there are people I've met who experience pain, obviously, as we're human, right? We all endure difficult things in our lives and experience pain. Um, But this idea of wanting to be able to bounce back from it, we have to be willing to have the pain that is going to be there inevitably. And the more that we try to fight it, control it, resist it, beat ourselves up for having it, um, tack on eyes and labels of what it means about us and how flawed we are, the more pain we're going to endure. And that's just the paradox of how it works. The more you don't want it, the more you got it. Right. And and I, I keep coming back, it, it, the educational piece of what is actually going on in the moment of distress and how the inner critic wants you to arrive at congruence and uses mm-hmm. the punishment, the guilt, the shame, the you're never going to have anything to mm-hmm. sort of, to self-correct. Yep. Right. But it's also not, if I don't sit with that experience, I'm not going to bounce back. And we're working together to have you bounce back. Exactly. So, yeah. so phase one assessment, right, mm-hmm. of, of experience. Yeah. What's the next chapter in terms of people working towards getting better? Yeah. And I think just going back to that, the awareness is also this idea of accepting pain. Right. You know, and I think going to your example of like, I'm in agony, like you want me to just sit with this and be with it. And it's so torturous. And I think the idea is acknowledging that there isn't anything you could really do to, to get rid of it. Right. And I'm not throwing a Xanax at you. Yeah. This, this doctor- and even that is temporary until the Xanax wears off or the next painful moment comes. Right. right. And it's this never ending cycle. So your infomercial isn't going to be come to my timeshare and you're going to have the best experience possible. Right. Right. You're, you're selling, Hey, your, your sale is you are in pain. Right. Own exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Own it. Give it the attention that it needs. Accept be, it. Right. And accepting doesn't mean being okay with it, that like it's okay to be in agony or you should be in agony, but that I am in agony and it sucks and it hurts. Right. And so that's the step one. And it's a very quick step, I think, too, of choosing to to have it and to allow your experience to be as it is. Because then when we move into phase two, then the learning can come in, Right of what is your pain even trying to tell you? Why is this happening? Why is the shame coming up? Why is the agony coming up? You know, if we bypass step one, where we just don't want to have it and it's not allowed, we won't get to step two in a way that's meaningful and really leads to the lasting change and happiness and growth that I think we all want, you know, the life satisfaction that we want. So phase two is going to be skill building. Yeah. And trying to... um use the information of the pain to help move through the pain and Mm -hmm. cope with it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think understanding the root of where it comes from on a human level. Why do we have fear? Why do we have shame? Why do we have guilt? Why do we have sadness and depression? All All of these experiences, putting labels to all of that. Let's go back to the individual who's not, um, uh, partnering and, and really feels, you know, Oh my God, I keep trying. Mm-hmm. I keep, I just don't have any energy for this anymore. I keep trying to date and I keep, I feel like I'm met with rejection. I'm, I'm obviously not okay. Um, there's something wrong with me. Um, okay, I notice it. I mm-hmm. notice that I end the sentence there. I notice that I go in tremendous shame about how I must suck mm-hmm. and so forth. And I'm, I'm so, so in the skill building piece of this, you're going to ask me, where does that come from? Yep. Right. Let's get to the origins of the, of this shame and this 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 harsh assessment. Mm-hmm. So it'll, it'll go into childhood and so forth in that way? It can. And I think also life experiences too. It's not all childhood, although, you know, we learn these templates of how to relate to ourselves and to others through our parents and through early experiences. So it, it is important sometimes to go back to that place. But I think, um, you know, people experience heartbreak and things not working out for them, being bullied, being teased, uh, being told they're not good enough. So you, you know, revisit, you know, the painful well, now moments. that you say it, I had some dates where I was just told you will never find anybody. Exactly. It's terrifying to me. Right. But you go back and you revisit the experiences that might have have um, really fortified the narrative. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's- and, and actually having um, people 
um, accept and work through those, right? Because going back to painful moments, that re-triggers pain again. And we don't want pain. At the end of the day, none of us want to feel pain. Um, and I think it's a, an ideal to want to be able to react in a way where you say, pain is valuable and this is going to teach me something, right? So going back to painful moments, I think, allows um, a space. So again, I, I could come back to the to the uh, dating experience I had, you know, 18 years ago, mm -hmm. hypothetically. Mm -hmm. And then I can do the same thing and start with the, you know, I don't want to feel this. And it can just recycle the same experience as the car accident or as the initial session where right. I told you about what's going on in the current my current life. I can do the same thing and try to run right through it and say, collect the story of why I suck and leave it there, mm -hmm. end, of, end of sentence. And you're, you as the guide, right, as the, as the healer, as the psychologist, are going to say, hold on, right? And let's sit with the pain, yeah. notice the pain, unpack it in a yeah. certain way. Create some distance from it. So you don't rush through it. Right. Right, and create some distance for what it's signaling. Yeah. Not that I am it. Yeah. Okay. So that's in phase two, you revisit how, how these, how, how the experience of shame and guilt or whatever else you're experiencing mm -hmm. is how it was born and developed. Yeah. And challenge the mind a bit of all the stories it's created and what it means about your life and what it means about your future and that end game, right? The period that it's final. I find myself saying to people, you're very committed to your narrative. Yeah. Right. Be very, very invested in holding on to your story. Mm -hmm. It's never going to happen for me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm undesirable. Whatever some, and I ask them why, if they think that the narrative serves them. Do you ever go there? Definitely. Like, yeah, okay. that thought was triggered right now, actually, as you were saying that, because I, I have found that, you know, those narratives when we are really fixed on this narrative, things aren't going to work out for me or some variation of that. We're really trying to present, prevent ourselves from failing, right? If I, if I can tell myself that it's not going to work out for me when it does, I'm not going to be disappointed, right? I'm going to be less disappointed or no one else can kind of so it's surprise a, me with this idea of failure. Because I'm already, I'm going to, so I'm, I'm gonna, already telling myself I'm, I'm going to beat fail. you to the punch. Yeah. So exactly. if I'm going to have the experience of not getting what I want and not delivering and not me, I may as well get to you before you get to me. World. Exactly. So I'll take it on as an identity and as a story. Right. Right. I so suck. when it inevitably happens that things don't work out because that's how life is, right? Everything just doesn't work out the way we want it to. I'm told you, right? That inner critic is like, right there to kind of rescue and say, I told you it wasn't going to work out for you. So you're the educator. Mm -hmm. You're like a professor. And what I keep hearing coming back to is I'm going to educate you about why the critic is doing what it does mm -hmm. and the mechanisms of the mind that are actually, however misguided on some level and however sometimes they could be, they can falter, right? If I over-absorb and over-identify. Right. If, if I don't have that distance. If I don't have that distance. Mm -hmm. But you're saying, I want you to notice the benefit of this. This is a protective agent. Right. Right? The story of I'm a failure and I have, I, I take it on, does serve me because then I don't, I don't have to try and walk through disappointment. Yeah. Right? There's a reason. Right. We can come back to that reason that I'm not good enough or I'm a unworthy or I'm a failure to explain a lot of our misfortunes in life. So I go after people. So I'll keep them and ultimately I'll get them. I'll arrive at a place of, yeah, I want to keep it. Mm -hmm. I want to keep that. Mm -hmm. It's too much. I want to keep that or I want to change it. But but it's an interesting moment where somebody actually. Because in the beginning of in the beginning of working with people, they're gonna fight me on holding on to their narrative. It's a it's a Survival. it's a battle of I'm threatening something here. Right. Once the once there's an awareness that the narrative is self serving, mm -hmm. right, and the narrative is self serving, I actually always look for ways to re engage mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Right. I just find that people will at that moment say, "Yeah, you're right." I'm not ready to give it up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's a freedom in that. Totally. I think that's a powerful stance, actually. You know, and I encourage that. Take ownership of it. Because once you do, then you're actually eliminating some of the suffering of I'm not in control here. Yeah, I, right? see, it, I see it a lot in addiction where, where somebody will make like a whole storyline of why it's everybody else's fault and you don't understand. I have to. 
And then we sort of, you know, stop the blame, mm-hmm. you know, like, let's, who are you kidding? You can't be, it's hard to be the, you know, crush it in life as, you, you know, you want to be a CEO, you're, you know, you have needles in your arm most of the day. It's probably hard to do both. So I own that. Mm-hmm. And at this point, why don't you just move to Portugal where drug, you just go do drugs all the time? Right. Yeah. No, no. That, and, uh, and that decision of I have a choice. Yep. Right. And I'm telling, I'm, I can't spin the story of it's your fault. Mm hmm. And I have to make a choice, and it's a hard choice. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably one of the most difficult things for us as humans is acknowledging that we do have a choice. Um, There is some relief, I think, in safety in putting faith out in either our flawed self or just that we got dealt a bad, um, you know, hand of cards, essentially, and other people didn't. You know, we get to, to take some refuge in that. Of lack of control, right? That it's not on us. It's not always fair. Yeah. You can't have it's fair. So phase two, I like a lot personally in terms of my work and phase three, Mm -hmm. in terms of skills, I'm curious in terms, um, what would self-compassion, if somebody who's really like soaking this up, Mm -hmm. what do they look like? Let's say the, the dating, the the dating person who's got the story and then it becomes open to the self-serving narrative and, and all that. Right. What does the self-compassion um, skill building look like? Yeah, so I think a lot of it is there's one exercise that I really like to do to kind of get people in this mindset. Um, and you do kind of have to move through these progressions. We can't just start session one with like, let's be compassionate toward our pain now, right? Because pain is complicated. But once we get to that place, you know, I really like to prompt people with, thinking of somebody that they really care about, you know, that's really easy to love. Um, It's not complicated. Um, And imagine that they're going through this same exact experience, right? That they're feeling unworthy. It's not going to work out for them. You know, they're too old, all these failed relationships. Um, How would you support them? Mm-hmm. You know, and I think naturally that that really starts to turn on our empathic response and it opens up the heart a bit more. That sounds a little hippy dippy, I know, right? But love really lives in that heart space. So I can't and do kindness. it. I can't be nice to me. I can't, I don't know how to do it, Mm -hmm. but I can be nice to someone else. Right. Someone I care about, you know, that's pretty easy to care about. So I, I, you help me to start, I want you to visualize for how long would you say? I actually have them write some stuff down. So you you actually journal it. Yeah. Um, well like in the session, you know, I'll have them, I'll ask the question. I'll say just off the top of your mind, write down how you would support this person. What would you say? What would you do? What, you know? How do you support other people when they're in pain? And it's pretty easy for most people to come up with things, right? As soon as they think of a person that they care about and imagining them really struggling and beating themselves up and feeling like life just isn't going to work out for them, people will come up with, you know, I tell them it's going to be okay or that you're going to get through it or I do something nice for them or I show up, you know, I check in, I give them a call, I take them out, I slew of things, right, that we do to help. To generate this empathy and compassion for another person. Right. What else do you do? Because yeah. in terms of, that's one thing where I start to uh, to cultivate, uh, you know, empathy and compassion. What would be another example of using mindfulness or, or any other skill to mm-hmm. engender um, com- self-compassion? Well, so following up on that, the last one, though, you know, I have them then bring it back to themselves. The self-compassion piece is, okay, is there a way that you can now try to support yourself in a similar way? Can you treat yourself like you would treat a friend or a family member or somebody that you really care about? Um, And do it on purpose, you know? So there is an intentionality to it, is acknowledging the pain. This is a really hard moment. This sucks. This hurts. I'm feeling really hopeless, right, or out of control. Things aren't going to work out, okay? Okay. I also know that I'm not alone in this part, right, that other people feel this too. I think that's another big educational step is acknowledging like, yes, we all have our own pains, but we all experience pain. This is this is the human experience. Totally. Right. Exactly. And we also all and and this mechanism you were talking about, which I just want to revisit the idea of is I the adaptive benefit of bypassing the pain Mm -hmm. and going to a you know, for however seeming, however misguided, I want to get rid of it quickly. The over-employing shame and guilt 
right? I'm, I'm as an organism, I'm trying to get relief. Right, right. right? By adding more pain to my pain and getting congruency. Getting this thing called congruency, yeah. like the stories line up. Yep. I suck. They suck. Yep. It, it sucks for them. I'm mm-hmm. the source of the suck. Mm-hmm. I feel good again because I got to get my story right. Right, right. I got, and and I, I got to get my story right, even if it means me pummeling myself because I need this congruency because I believe it'll help me get through the pain better. Right, exactly. And I want out of the pain. Yes. So- so you come in and you're like, no, you got to stay with the pain. Mm-hmm. You got to learn how to first have compassion for others, then practice compassion for yourself. Then mm-hmm. you're going to go, ugh. Mm-hmm. When you're nice to yourself, I imagine the first thing and like, I want you to give yourself a hug or something. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Exactly. I don't want to hear. It's about, always the first response. Right? I feel like, like. Ugh, <laughs> a vomit on you. Uh-huh. For, if you tell me to hug myself. Yeah. Right? Are you kidding? Mm-hmm. What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. That's the first response. Totally. And then, it was and then, my first response when then, I got into this work. Like then, what? No way. And then way. what's the what's the fourth and fifth response? Um, you know, I think it's it's actually more so of shifting the relationship that we start to have with our pain. Big picture, right? Is being able to change the habit. The habit right now is to give ourselves tough love, kick ourselves when we're down, right? Get congruency in this narrative that this is all happening because I suck or I'm terrible or whatever it might be. And to start to shift some of that relationship, to be able to just acknowledge like, yeah, this is hard, right? And it's hard for other people too. Other people experience pain because I think in our pain, we can feel really alone that I suck. It's all about me and Mm -hmm. everyone else is less flawed than I am. And the reality is we all share similar uh, experiences in terms of pain. Do you go spiritual on them? Because you were talking earlier about the, it's not the I being Mm -hmm. the sort of the, the, like almost like a parasite in the host, right? You know, I've heard that analogy and there's a broader, bigger picture beyond the I. Mm -hmm. Do you go there? I do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think once people are able to contact that, when they really do get that space and they're able to create some distance from their pain, Mm -hmm. that you really get connected with that deeper sense of self, you know, and that that deeper sense of self is deserving and is good. This is, you know, this is just human nature that there isn't a selective selectivity of who's worthy and who's not right. That we we're all kind of in this shared interconnected need for being worthy and deserving. So you go a touch hippie. I do. Right? Yeah. Evidence-based hippie. Evidence-based integrative hippie, right? Evidence-based integrative (laughs) hippie, right? Which is cool. And you say, hey, whatever narrative you're in, there's something, there's a piece behind that, Mm -hmm. that we're all, that we all, a shared space. Yeah. You use the word distance a lot. Mm -hmm. If you access that, that's the space that you're going to become self-compassionate. Yeah. That's where you're going to access self-compassion. There's a lot of vulnerability there, though. I think people really try to move away from that, even if there is some hope that that is the case or, okay, I can understand what you're saying. I think um, our natural instinct to cut ourselves out from feelings that are don't, you know, that are scary or that are uncertain. It's too intimate. Intense, right? Yeah, that we, we kind of create these walls. And so even allowing yourself to really take that in requires us to be vulnerable, to be willing to open up to some of these more intimate feelings. Um, You know, and I I tend to use this analogy with people, like we all kind of want love and we want the good stuff in life, the pleasure and the joy. And, you know, that's what we're striving for most of us in life. Yet when we close off, you know, I'm not allowed to feel sad or, you know, ashamed or I'm not allowed to make mistakes. I'm not allowed to have these other experiences. We actually close off our experience to all of it. So when I think of a graduate of your practice, Mm -hmm. right, I think of someone who has a good read on how it all works and a good read of creating distance, but also saying, like, I can't insist on having only one experience. I have to be able to walk through many experiences. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean if I graduate from your, if I see you for a year and I'm, I get your green light, it doesn't mean I'm not going to have shame and guilt. Totally. Right. Yeah. You're not promising that. You're saying you'll be able to walk through it with some different perspective and invite um, a healing agent in, yeah. right, of yeah. compassion and not being isolated and an acknowledgement um, and an awareness that will actually make it a totally different experience. Right. And and learn from it, you know, mm-hmm. and it, you know, seeing actually the value, even befriending some of your shame. I know that also sounds a little hippy dippy, right? But really being able to see the value of pain, 
there is value in pain if we're able to use these tools and kind of shift this relationship and perspective and and hold it in a different space, right. in it's a kinder the, space. In the in the anti shame way. Yep. Right. This feels like the shame is the anti self compassion. Very right? much. Right. And so. self compassion is the sort of the anecdote for yeah. for shame. Right. Right. And I often use the analogy, another exercise I do to get people in this mind space and really feeling it experientially versus intellectually um, is, you know, just imagining themselves as children. You know, children for the most part are pretty innocent. Uh, if you think of a three-year-old, four-year-old, right, that they're, they, we, we can't really project too much on them in terms of their responsibility of being bad or flawed or things not working out for them. And so if we can imagine ourselves as children, um, you know, in our adult self kind of talking to that child, knowing what that child is going to endure, what are some things you might share in terms of trying to alleviate their pain or their suffering? And I think that can be a really vulnerable place for people to go to, to kind of attend to some pain, old pains, pains in their lives. So if you had one thing to leave an audience with in Mm -hmm. terms of how you would want them to treat themselves... Yeah. What would be one message you you as a psychologist, healer, um, integrator of technique? Um, what would you want to say to people about how to treat themselves? You know, I guess my my mission and my hope for for most of the people that I work with, and even for myself, is to really be able to see the value in all of our experiences. You know, and to acknowledge that you are worthy and you are um, deserving of being able to live the life that you want to live. And to get to that place, um, it's going to require some bravery and strength to acknowledge your pain, be with your pain, um, and also share the love that you share with other people with yourself. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, I think the Buddha said it best, right? You more than anybody else is deserving of your love and affection. That's something that I think I really kind of ascribe to in my own life and in my practice, that if we can really learn to believe that and to hone in and contact that part of ourselves that is worthy of love, um, then, you know, we can keep moving toward offering and sharing some of the love with ourselves. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. That was so interesting. Thank you so much mm-hmm. for uh, sharing with us on getting better with Dr. Adam. Yeah. Thank you. I for loved having, having me. with you. I loved having you, and I loved uh, hearing your insights. Um, good luck. Thank you. This podcast is for general information and entertainment purposes only. This should not be considered treatment advice, nor is it a substitute for an individual treatment plan. If you have questions or concerns about your individual situation, it is strongly recommended you consult a licensed professional to talk about things that are specific to you. If there is an emergency, it is strongly recommended you seek treatment at your nearest emergency room.